In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Raphael Lorenko about how you can reduce fraud in your e-commerce business. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 83. Today's episode is sponsored by Drip. Drip is the world's first e-commerce CRM and a tool that I personally use for email marketing and automation. Now, if you're ever in an e-commerce store, you need to give Drip a try, and here's why. Drip offers one-click integrations for both Shopify and Magento. There's robust segmentation, personalization, and revenue dashboards to give you an overview of how your automation emails are performing. One of my favorite features of Drip is the Visual Workflow Builder. It gives you a super easy way to build out your automation world visually and see the entire process. It lets you get started quickly, but also build very complex automation roles. It's powerful, but also easy to learn, unlike a lot of email tools that offer the same type of automation. To get a demo of Drip today, you can go head over to drip.com slash BOE. That's drip.com slash BOE. Now onto the show. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pleski, and I'm here today with Raphael Lorenko. Raphael is the EVP at ClareSale, the lead is in e-commerce fraud protection and prevention solutions with chargeback protection as well. I wanted to ask Raphael on the show today to talk a bit about how you can reduce fraud in your e-commerce store. So hey, Raphael, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing very well, and you? Doing good. Happy to have you on the show. This is a... Uh, Exciting topic for me, at least. I feel like not a lot of folks talk enough about, um, you know, what to do like after the sale. And a lot, you know, when you kind of look into e-commerce and a lot of kind of the information you get is based around how to grow top line revenue. But something like fraud protection is one of those great things you can do that if you have revenue currently, just doing, you know, moving the needle and just improving improving that one factor of the business pays off dividends. So it's one of those topics I like love talking about because it can help so many folks. Um, so first, um, what is some, you know, what are some things when you say fraud protection, are you talking about before the sale is made, stopping the actual fraud coming in? Or, I mean, I guess to back up even more, let's define fraud, right? In e-commerce. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I'm talking no. about credit cards, you know, bad, bad numbers, that sort of thing. What, how do you define that exactly? Right. So there are multiple ways in which fraudsters obviously can affect uh, a business or an online business, right? So, and, and one of the most important of them in terms of um, how much it affects the bottom line is what we call uh, uh, the chargebacks, which are the transactions that you accepted in your website, usually with uh, card, uh, credit cards. And they, um, the, the actual cardholder will say that the, the, he or she doesn't recognize the transaction. And then he or she will ask for a reimbursement, the cardholder. And then the, bank, the issuer bank will give the money back to this person. And then this liability, this financial liability, when it comes to card not present transactions, are, uh, the liability is on the merchant's shoulders. Right. So which means that, let's say you sold one hundred million, one hundred thousand dollars in a given month. Eventually, two or three of these transactions will get back to you as chargebacks. And then you have to pay back your bank and not, not a lot of your um, revenues can be really recognized. And on the other hand, you lose probably you, you lost probably your, your the products you shipped or, or the services. Yeah. you uh, offer to, to our customers. So the, the fraud mainly clear sales focused on is the chargeback. So this, this improper usage of credit cards. And it could also be if you get enough of them, um, and I think the percent varies, but it can also damage your merchant account as well, right? Where, For sure. Yeah. yeah. I've heard of people. Yeah. Card, card, card processings are always worried about merchants, especially the smaller ones that are eventually uh, above a certain threshold. Usually traditionally we were talking about 1%. So 1%... If above one percent of your sales turn into chargebacks, then you're you might be in trouble. You might have a problem with your merchant ID and stuff like that. Mm, okay, so one percent is kind of the the, the least. Yeah, problem. yeah, especially for Visa and Mastercard traditionally, and the way they calculate it is the number of transactions uh, chargebacks over the the total number of transactions on a given month. Is it one percent of transactions or one percent of um, dollar value? You, yeah, yeah. I mean, traditionally, the the right way of defining the chargeback rate, in my opinion, is always looking at dollars. But the reality is that more commonly than not, the the the, the, the acquirers, Visa and Mastercard, will make the calculation based on number of orders. Got it. Okay. 
So mainly we're talking about chargebacks. Um, and it's one of those things that it's the, I mean, chargebacks in general, right? You hear this thing all the time of, you know, e-commerce folks are just unhappy about it, right? Um, I happen to, I was at a talk a couple of years ago with, um, it was Patrick, the founder of um, Stripe was talking and somebody raised a hand and asked like, what are you doing to help stop chargebacks? And I forget his quote, but it was something with, he was saying that, you know, chargebacks are one of these things where you almost need them, right? Because you're essentially asking someone to um, give, basically give someone they don't know access to take out some random amount of money from their bank account. So as a buyer, you need, you do, do you need chargebacks just because that is the only last line of protection for the buyer uh, to assume they don't get fraud, but people abuse them, right? Where you've had the thing, most retailers have had this before where you ship the product, you know, they've received it and they do a chargeback and like, and there's also the chargeback of, um, like a stolen card, that sort of thing. So there's different reasons mm -hmm. for chargeback as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're completely right. So you're talking about two main, uh, or three main categories of chargebacks, right? One of them is, is what we call commercial disagreement. So for any reason, the buyer thinks, uh, he or she didn't receive or she didn't get what the, uh, he or she expected. Right. So this is one thing. And the way to mitigate it is obviously making making it the more clear you can in your terms and conditions and um, better pictures of your product, whatever goes in that direction. But this is usually limited and it's it's under the control of the, the merchants. Then you have two types of fraudulent chargebacks. One of them is what we call friendly fraud. So you're talking about either somebody in a bad faith utilizing the credit card and then asking the product and then claiming that he or she didn't make the, the purchase or the most dangerous one, at least in terms of scalability, is the actual fraud uh, in which it's somebody like a criminal utilizing somebody else's uh, credit card. So I'd say that you can categorize the chargeback into these three, the commercial disagreement, the friendly fraud and the actual fraud. And, what's, and what is the friendly fraud again? How do you categorize that? So the friend, yeah, the friend of the fraud is mainly uh, absorbs two types of situations. One, um, I am utilizing my own credit card and in bad faith, I'm telling you the merchant that I didn't make this purchase just to get my money back. I mean, you know that I got the product, you have the receipt of uh, uh, delivery and stuff like that. Okay, got it. Inside, yeah, inside friendly fraud, you also have somebody that I know took my wallet or something or the, the credit card the data, let's say my wife, my son, my parents, whatever, they and then made the same thing, did the same thing. Sometimes I don't even know and that's why it's called friendly because sometimes it comes from like a, a, a fire from a, from, a, from a friend, right? Um, and this is also categorized as friendly fraud and this is also, but this is still fraud. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a problem for you to get your money back as a merchant, even though for the for for these ones, especially if you have the receipt of uh, um, delivery and stuff like that, it's kind of an easier way to, to prevent, um, be, not to prevent, but to mitigate because you can uh, dispute those chargebacks. And there are several companies and services out there that help you doing this. That's not exactly what ClearSale does, but that's definitely correlated with what you, we do. So disputing uh, is effective if you're talking about the friendly fraud. But it's not effective if you're talking about um, about um, the actual fraud, because well, well the, the banks will say you are responsible for your own website security and you allow them a criminal utilizing uh, uh, your website for a fraud. So therefore, you were respons financially responsible for that transaction. And that's the, the story that's more scary for most merchants. Got it. So if it's in the first or second category, then... Mm -hmm. um, trying to effectively fight with, um, you know, responding to it and trying to provide paperwork, receipts, that sort of thing, you may or may not win the dispute and using disputes. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to actual fraud, like a real stolen credit card, and yeah. they don't know. You're not, yeah, you're never going to win a dispute for, for a, an actual fraud because the bank is basically uh, right, right? So, I mean, uh, you were responsible for the security and you, did, and you allowed the, the, the transaction to go through. Okay, so when it's, when you suspect they really got the product um, and someone's trying to do the friendly fraud, it's dispute time. When you, right. when the first category, is that kind of dispute or what should you do in that case? Well, in the case of commercial disagreement, if you have a problem with like, like your threshold, for instance, you are around 1%, the, 
the best way is to try to avoid that before it happens, right? So you're talking about customer service, you're talking about talking to the customer, sending a gift card or anything that replaces in the, uh, uh, the lo reverse logistics, taking the product back and sending whatever uh, else the product, the, the consumer thought he or she bought and stuff like that. So you got to avoid it from happening. If it, you are under 1%, I mean, there's not too much you can do unless, I mean, ma make the user a better experience, make the user experience better for the consumer in a way that you make it uh, more clear in your website in terms of item description and stuff like that. I mean, it's much more about uh, uh, avoiding this to happening again than actually dealing with this particular transaction because in this particular transaction, you can, I mean, if the customer is happy with you, he or she will ask the money back, but then you can talk directly to them and, and, and make something out of it. Um, yeah, I feel like that's the one we, the retailer has the most control, right? Where mm -hmm. they're yes, happy, sure. maybe the product's just not with it. Like they ordered a shirt and it doesn't fit well. And instead of returning it, yeah. you know, some, I've kind of found some buyers, um, their first thought is to return something, but their second thought, uh, some other buyers, their first thought is just to do a chargeback. Like if you don't like the shirt, mm -hmm. yeah, charge yeah. back. And like, yeah, instead, instead of talking to the merchant, right? Which is not, it's weird, but it happens a lot. Yeah, it happens. And so those are the ones where maybe they just could, you know, they came to the site and they couldn't figure out the, um, you know, they couldn't find the link to return a product. So they literally just called Visa and hit the chargeback button. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And and it's unfortunate that the banks allow those chargebacks so easily because that's not the real uh, real motivation for a chargeback. But because the financial liability is not on the bank's shoulders but on the merchants, sometimes they are a little bit more you know uh, open to these kind of uh, situations than um, than in others. But um, but it's I mean if, uh, if you're starting your business and growing your business you're probably going to face a few times this kind of situation and you're going to learn from them and you're going to probably be changing, um, changing it in a way that you make it a very small, very tiny percentage of your orders. Um, usually stable, stable and organized merchants don't have that much of a problem in this matter. What are some tips if people are getting, you know, a little uncomfortably high on that first one, right? Where people are just, they're legitimate buyers, but they are having some issues with, um, you know, chargebacks that could otherwise be avoided. What are some kind of tips there? Well, I'd say that the 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 more you clear you make it clear in your website the information about the product, either through the pictures, either through the descriptions, either through the terms and conditions, uh, delivery time, shipping uh, shipping time, and stuff like that. Um, the lower the chances are uh, that the consumer will you know, uh, disagree with whatever he or she received. So I'd say that uh, it's a marketing effort to make it the, the, the user experience better. Then it's, it's again, another thing that makes, has to do with the, the next uh, subject we are talking about in a minute, but it's making this experience of the person uh, regretting or, or changing an idea, making it better. I mean, trying, because we, we know how lifetime of, Lifetime value of the customer sometimes is much more important than this particular transaction, right? So you're making this particular situation, this particular experience, a good experience so that the customer will come back and buy, buy uh, more frequently with you in the future. Sometimes you're, you're spending money in the day zero, but then a few days later or a few months later, you have the customer back and you have a loyal customer. And that's the second tip. I mean, um, trying to see the long term when it comes to situations like this. Yeah, and being a brand that's kind of known for that, um, like for instance, had an issue with like L.O. Bean boots one time, and L.O. Bean's mm -hmm. just known where you literally just walk in and you're like, I just don't like these. Like I wore them around and yeah. don't like them, and they're like, Oh, cool. And you're like, Oh, that conversation yeah, was really even, short. Even Zappos. Yeah, yeah, Zappos for instance yeah. uh, is a is a, a famous business case in that matter too. The, they just say if you don't if you don't like, just return, and, and I mean they make very loyal. And that sounds like the key for the first, um, you know, the first category of just people that want to return something. And it's almost like they can't, or you're making barriers like artificially difficult and just things are a little opaque and they can't find the return link or they just don't know how to do it. And instead eventually of, they're going to eventually, yeah. right. Instead of, instead of spending 30 minutes running around your site, trying to figure out and they call the number and it goes to voicemail. Like basically every, every time you put up one of those walls, the chance of somebody just saying, you know what, I'm done. I'm calling. A credit card company chargeback that was easier like when it's easier to call the credit card company 
than call the retailer, it sounds like you're gonna you're in trouble right now. Yeah, I think you summarized very well. Okay, so make may, wait on hold less time with your you know um, with your company than with Visa, and then you win basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the then in the case of um, you know people getting the product and doing the whole friendly fraud, what mm -hmm. is that? You're just talking. You should um, you should fight the chargeback, or yeah. is that just is that the like there you're not going to yeah, talk the, to people, right? You're just going to have to What find we it. learned, yeah, what we learned during the last years about it is that people talk to each other, right? So um, we know that some of these friendly fraud are inevitable. I mean, people talking to the other. Uh, I mean, this the, the son, grandson, daughter, granddaughter, stuff like that do happen. Um, and sometimes, I mean, it was supposed to be a surprise and somebody buys somebody's, somebody else's gift. So in these situations, I mean, it's just a matter of, again, going back to communication and eventually even the cardholder will uh, understand what happened and customer service is very important. However, the, what, what affects more this particular number, this particular KPI, that is the friendly fraud rate, is the is the people are the people that do this for on purpose, right? So they do the they, they do the they do this to uh, take advantage from a, let's say a, a breach in the system. And in this case, what we learned is that again, people talk to each other, and there's a network, there is you know forums online in the deep web and stuff like that that people tell to each other which are the merchants that allow more or less uh, this kind of situation. And um, and that's why the disputes are a good way of working with these situations. Just because, I mean, once you avoid it to, from happening or once you take the money back or once you, the chargeback is not successful, then the person didn't, what, didn't get what they wanted and they will tell the others. They will spread the word about, well, in this particular website, it's hard to, to make this, to commit this crime, let's say. And this is... This is interesting because what happens with friendly fraud, let's say specifically talking about somebody using, let's say myself utilizing my own card, I only have one identity. I only have my own identity if I want to make a friendly fraud, right? While if I'm talking about an actual fraud, I have other 7 billion people to steal data from. Um, uh, that's why I'm also focused on the actual fraud because that's where you can really be hit, and hit by uh, criminals and organized crime, uh, because on the friendly fraud is very limited the, the, how, how big the problem can be. Of course, from time to time, some merchants are hit more uh, harder or, or, or softer by situations like this. But the real problem, the real problem, uh, the real issue might be with the, the, the actual fraud, just because of identity and, and data availability. I can, again, I can only do friendly frauds once or at least with data from one person that is myself. While if I'm a criminal, I can do friendly, I can do actual fraud with your credit card, with your information, with my neighbors or whoever else in the world. That's a good point. Yeah. And you can only probably do it even if you're an individual doing it with your own information. You can do it once with one retailer and you can move to a different retailer, but you can only do that so many times too, right? Because at some point Visa is going to notice, okay, you did nine chargebacks this month. There's something going on a little, little odd here, and probably flag your account. So they only have so many, uh, you know, so many opportunities there. Yeah, and you raise a good point when you when you mentioned the multiple merchants, right? So as a merchant, of course, you gotta you gotta be worried about your own uh, business, your about your own transactions. But the reality is, the most efficient tools and, and and elements to prevent fraud is having a connection somehow with other merchants. I mean, through technology, whatever. Because fraudsters, and especially cr uh, organized criminals, will not do like they will not make it just to have a pair of shoes. They are this is their business. This is their, their source of revenue. They are trying to do big 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 money with that. Eventually, they will hit you there. But you're not the first one they are trying to fraud, right? Especially if they have a lot or a bunch of credit cards that they think they will work. They will take these same credit cards and try mo in multiple merchants. Um, um, and which which leads us to the perception or to the uh, re realizing that you can't fight fraud for your, by yourself. You need some sort of network on that matter. Um, um, and that that's why companies like ClearSale or even the payment gateways try as much as we we can 
to utilize a unique database of transactions so that you can take advantage from uh, not only the negative uh, track record of each customer, but also from the positive ones, right? So the blacklists and whitelists, uh, as some people will say, I mean, if you, it's you, Charles, buying with your credit card, um, um, sh delivering to a cert to the same shipping address you did before six months ago, and there was no charge back, then it's a much easier way, a much easier decision to make, right? I will approve this order. While if I'm doing by myself as a merchant and I don't have access to other people's historic historic data, then it means that it's going to be harder to me. So you raise a good point when you mention the multiple merchants. Yeah. What do you have any tricks to? I mean, two things first. Is there any tricks to identifying? Hey, this has been friendly fraud. To at least know what you're working with, and then once you do, and let's just say you do get the charge back, any kind of tips on fighting that? Like how to best um, deal with that? Because you get that letter from the bank, and it's usually this very odd process where they just ask you for mm -hmm. kind of every every piece of documentation that ever existed and things you don't have, like a like a signature and stuff like that. So yeah. first, how do you identify it? And second, how do you deal with it if it does happen? Well, the first thing is, I mean, you got to have a very, um, the more comprehensive uh, set of data as you can. I mean, regarding logistics, whoever is your logist logistics company, you got to take some documentation from there. And even from some um, situations, let's say if the person got in touch, if you have the recording of the phone call and stuff like that will be useful. Um, many merchants try to do it by themselves internally, but you do have also the possibility of hiring a third party to do this. I mean, ClearSeal doesn't offer this service, but there are plenty of uh, options in the market, either in terms of technology, meaning somehow you're still doing, out, uh, you're, you're still doing internally as a merchant, but you are utilizing somebody else's platform, somebody else's technology that uh, brings together these documents and, and kind of file all the disputes at, at the same time and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And then on top of that, you have a different type of uh, um, solution provider out there that are the, the companies that outsource this process. So they, they will literally have people uh, 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 doing the disputes on your behalf. Of course, the business, uh, the business model of these different solution providers will vary according to how much comprehensive their, their solution uh, are, their, their solution is, but uh, you have plenty of options. Companies like uh, mitigators, chargeback911, chargebacks.com, um, plenty of companies out, chargebackgurus.com, all of those companies uh, can help you with this kind of situation. Okay, that's good to know. I, I wasn't aware of that. Because um, one of those things too, you get that form and it says details and you're like, I don't know what to write here. You know, in the first couple of times you do it, it's literally just like not really sure what to do versus hiring someone like that that's actually doing these in bulk and probably get some you know, get some sort of indicators on, well, if we write this, here's a success ratio versus this, and they can right. try things. Yeah, so for sure. Right with a yeah, they utilize, yeah, they utilize some sort of machine learning to, they, they know the shortcut. Yep. That might be an option, even though, I mean, they might charge you for success, and, and it, which means a certain level of commissioning on the, the earnings you get. But I mean, eventually it's better than getting anything, right? Yeah, it's better than getting nothing. Plus also plus a fee, so you're actually you know you're out the money, you're out the product, and then you're out a fee on top of that. So it's, it gets expensive quick. Um, what I always did, and if you do it yourself, um, just my own little tip is just have a literally just a checklist that you run through because they all kind of have about the same stuff. Um, and if you just basically run through and say, all right, here's a chargeback letter, and you literally just go one, two, and each one is like a link that takes you. Here's where it goes to the store. You get that. Here's where you grab this. Yeah, yeah. You have I'd say that the, the number one element there is the, the the proof of delivery. I mean, the fact that you have the signature or at least something coming from uh, FedEx or UPS or whoever um, that the product was in fact delivered to that address. The address is the most important piece of information in any fraud prevention understanding. I mean, if we're doing the storytelling around that particular order. The address is, uh, plays an important role there, um, and and that's 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 the I'd say the key for any dispute as well. Okay, that's a good tip right there. So don't try to you know, don't try to go into the details and tell a long story on what you think happened. Um, just show them the address. Show, hey, here's the shipping address. Here's you know FedEx. It was verified. Here's where it went. Um, 
we did our best, right? So that sort of thing. And if it matches the card holder's actual address, then, you know. Yeah, you have a much better chance of winning the dispute. Gotcha. Okay. So third, um, kind of the third, and this is kind of probably the most nefarious, right? Where it's actual fraud of, it's almost like an attack on you at this point of it's somebody targeting basically your site. And I'm guessing this kind of happens in like the dark web, whatever that, whatever that means. But in kind of, you pitch a, you know, very shadowy internet places where people say this website has very limited fraud protection, go get it. And then all of a sudden there's people coming from all directions, right? Yeah. That's so um, first, yeah, sure. No, you're, you're right. And, and it's important to mention that even though we, we, we let it, we, we're talking as the third one is actually represents around 80% of the chargebacks, right? So we're talking about an average in the U S of, Chargebacks representing around 0.9% of a merchant's revenue. Uh, if it's 0.9, in 80% of this is is friendly fraud. Uh, sorry, it's actual fraud. We're talking about um, around 70 basis points, points uh, 0.70% of all your revenues are, are going through uh, um, the chargeback, the actual fraud chargebacks, the actual fraudulent chargebacks, and that's main. In sometimes it represents like 10% of our margins. We know how competitive the, the retailer space uh, is right now. And then if you're having a margins of 10% and you're losing 0.7% of those uh, in, 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 your, in, your, um, in your chargeback, then you're, you're, you're down in 10% for your margin. So that's why uh, ClearSale focused on this particular uh, problem. And that's why I believe um, that's, that's what the, the merchants should be spending more time in, uh, just because again, it's the, the other two ones are limited, even though they are important, they might hurt a little bit your, 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 your business. The, the, the actual fraud is actually the, the one in which you've got to be more worried about. Yeah. And kind of the two worst things about it too, is a, they typically aren't buying the cheapest product in your site. So they don't come by the coffee mug. They come by the, you know, espresso machine, the thousand dollar espresso machine. They don't buy the $10 coffee mug. And then also, and I don't know if this is what you found, but when it hits, it feels like you don't get one, you get like nine of them at the exact, like all of a sudden within a day. And you're like, how'd that all happen? Like Tuesday morning. It's just, yeah. yeah. And so it happens. No, you're, completely, you're completely right. I mean, people think about this guy, uh, you know, buying a pair of shoes for himself. And that's not the case. I mean, yes, it happens from time to time. And it does represent around 10% of the frauds. Of, uh, but the reality is we're talking about real uh, organized criminals and people that, you know, uh, sophisticated uh, ways of uh, getting to your website, sophisticated ways of um, um, hacking, sophisticated ways and mainly of obtaining credit card numbers and people's information. You know, I mean, with all the data breaches that are being you know, announced and everybody knows about, um, you can imagine how much easy it is to get somebody else's information uh, in, the, in the dark web. So um, that's, that's the, the real threat, right? This sounds like um, one of the times where like software basically does the best job at this, right? Where it's, it is hard to identify on your own. I, um, I know back in the day, um, so my, uh, my very basic version of doing this was basically getting all the orders each day, anything that um, coming up with a report at the end of the day, basically of order volume, um, order value, um, shipping address, billing address, and a couple key factors in saying, Hey, if the dollar value is over X, um, and the shipping address doesn't mark the billing address, flag that order immediately and follow this process. And I would kind of just have a checklist and a V8 at the time kind of ran through this uh, virtual assistant. Basically every day they would get a report and quite literally it was like automation using a human where they looked down a list and said, if these addresses don't match and it's over X amount of dollars this should at least be flagged for follow-up. And then I would usually go on and look and kind of do a little more due diligence, even, even call them and just say, you know, kind of do this phone call and say, Hey, you know, I just want to make sure you get your product. Is this, what you, you know, just kind of want to check in and, you know, is this what you're looking for? And sometimes a person would say, yeah, I'm actually on vacation and forgot something and made this big order and ordered it to wherever. And you'd say, Oh, great. I got it. Other times it would go to like a, um, you know, like, it wasn't a real phone number and they'd email them and it wasn't a real email address. And you're like, Oh, and then you'd go into Google maps and it would be this, like, like a warehouse somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And you're like, Ooh, this doesn't feel good. Um, 
so that was my method of doing it, which was very time consuming. Um, and yeah, took, you were basically like a detective every time this happened. And then the worst part is they already made the charge at that point. So you were stopping it. You were kind of just trying to stop the order from going out. Um, so you're able to kind of stop half of the problem, but you weren't able to get, I was never able to get in front of it, right. Of saying, let's stop the charge from actually occurring. So it sounds like that's something Clarecell and some sort of automation can actually help with, right? Yeah, yeah, you're completely right. So the, the process you just described is the traditional way of doing fraud prevention. And it's not far from what, you know, the top, the top edge peop, uh, companies and merchants are doing. It's just a matter of eventually they are doing this much more efficiently and less time consuming, but the steps are exactly the same. What's different? So let's pick up three main differences between the, the process you just described from the process that I consider the, you know, the most innovative or the, the, the most efficient thing, way to do it. The first is what you did by uh, flagging these orders and, and looking at them with your own eyes. Nowadays are, is, are, are being done by machine learning, right? So the, there's a score, there's an algorithm that wages different uh, aspects of an order. In case of clear sales uh, uh, fraud score, we're talking about 300 different variables um, being you know, weighted. Some products are riskier than the others. Some regions are riskier than the others. The fact that the, the addresses don't match is a problem, but depending if it's the same city or if it's the same state or it's like different coasts, they, are, uh, all, they have different wages. So a lot of different aspects, we, I can spend an hour talking about them here, but a lot of different aspects are taken into account and we are, uh, the, we are uh, making a risk assessment of each order and assigning a score, a fraud score to each of them. And that's going to be a key element into deciding if this order is going to be approved automatically, so just go away, go through, or these orders are going to be flagged. One thing that I like it about what you just described, that is not all customers or all merchants that do, is instead of declining those orders based on something that you found that is not uh, good, you reviewed those. You kind of made, as you said, the detective job of make, <laughs> taking a second look. And that's much better than decline. And that's, that's again, eventually the, the thing that ClearSail believes and does differently from ever, anybody else. The standard way that merchants are doing right now is eventually flagging and uh, in, in, in enabling some filters, some fraud filters. Let's say IP, if the IP address is a proxy instead of uh, a regular IP, they will block the order. I understand, I get why, why merchants do it because they don't have time to review the order instead of decline. Um, but I know that I, the proxy IPs uh, will have eventually a much higher risk than a regular order. But even within, I'll take this as an example, prox, IP proxy, we're still talking about 20 to 30% of those orders are fraudulent, which means that 70 to 80% of them are actually good orders. And if you're declining those orders, you are actually losing the chance of having them as actual revenue. So again, I think this is an, a very interesting uh, story, story you just told me in which you're, you flag those, those uh, suspicious orders to review later. That's exactly how I would recommend a merchant to do instead of just filtering or, or blocking those orders before they, they happen, right? Um, the other point that is different, uh, that I would say that is better to do differently than you were doing is the payment processor, right? Is the, pay is the payment step. What the ideal scenario, and uh, again, ClearSale may do it in different ways, but the, ideally what we would do is getting a pre-authorization from the credit card, and most of the payment gateways in the US can do it. Understand, and that tells you if they have credit or not, if they, they have the, the funds or not, then make these transactions on hold while you make this decision. So in case of ClearSale, 95% of the orders will be automatically approved, and they will go through, but the 5% that is flagged as risky, in your case, probably the percentage was a little higher because instead of machine learning, you were utilizing your own intuition, but let's say that the 20% of, or 30% of orders you flagged in the past, instead of the, uh, letting it go in terms of payment, they are on hold. So the payment is waiting for this clear sale uh, uh, or the fraud prevention status. 
So clear sail model in, into the, the uh, I mean, we have uh, integration models with different and several e-commerce platforms. So let's take uh, Magento or Shopify as an example. The status of this order will be on hold, will be uh, waiting for a fraud prevention decision. And when you say on hold, it's they were authorized but not captured, right? So you know the money's, so you did half, right? The money's there and you know it could be pulled, but you just haven't actually pulled it yet. So you never, yes, perfect. So like you never actually, there will be no, they can't be charged back because you haven't actually done anything. You've only checked right. at this point. Okay. Right. Got it. Of course, you have, you have a certain, a certain SLA to make your decision. Yep. Uh, either if it's 48 hours, 24 hours, or before midnight of the same day, de de depends on your payment processor. Uh, but yes, you describe it perfectly. We are, talk we are talking about authorizing, but not capturing. Okay, and the nice part about that too is if it's a prepaid card, the you know, if it's a credit card and has a high limit, that's one thing. It doesn't really matter. But if it's a prepaid card, you you basically like lock down that money for those, let's say, 48 hours where they can't spend it on something else. It's so it's your money if you decide to take it in the next 48 hours. Yes, exactly. Got it. Exactly. Okay. And, and it's exactly how you describe it because it's your decision yep. as a merchant, right? So you want to decide if you want to take the risk or not. Then the third point that I'd say that it may, uh, uh, may be done differently than what you did in the past is when you said, I was doing by myself, right? So especially if you're a small merchant, again, you have somebody else that can do it for you in a much more professional way. In place of clear sale, for instance, we have 700 um, uh, fraud analysts that on, the only thing they do for a living is preventing fraud, right? So they are looking at transactions that are flagged. Again, they only represent 5% of the total orders, but, um, but they have to make uh, the decision for each of them. Eventually, they will call. Eventually, they will utilize social network uh, to find out what's going on with this order. And one thing that I like it about what you were describing is the storytelling. There's also, I mean, the, for the toughest orders, and believe me, the orders that everybody else will decline, clear sale tries our best to approve, because let's say you are moving, so you are buying furniture and electronics uh, all over the place, right? So you, are, you are actually doing a, a not standard behavior, but you're a good customer. And I don't want to lose this, uh, this 10 uh, uh, furniture on my store, because I want you to be my loyal uh, consumer later. So ClearSale always gives a chance to every of these orders and tries to find what we call this storytelling around the, the order, uh, which, which is not only you know, the human touch, the human uh, work, but also a lot of technology. So we, we bring to this human being a lot of information about the consumer and each of the data points included in the transaction. And the good thing about having a third party doing this doing this besides uh, instead of doing yourself. Of course, the fact that we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's, it's a plus. Uh, weekends, blah, blah, blah. It's obviously the fact that we have 700 people. So if you double your, your number of orders from one day to the other, it's not a big problem for a clear sale and, and we can handle it. But the, the thing that I like the most about outsourcing it, and again, I'm giving the example of clear sale, but it could be anybody else that does the outsourcing. Is the fact that as a third party, we can look at the orders from different merchants. So I see you doing your purchase here. You're buying, let's say, a mattress and a TV and something else. And then I see that in another merchant, you utilize the same credit card and you're buying um, a computer and a table with uh, some uh, chairs. So it's much easier for me to understand what's going on with you. We're moving from one house to the other. You need to buy furniture for your new house. That's simple. While if you're looking at this order solely based on your own history and, you, and this particular customer has never bought before in your store, you don't have a clue. You're just a, it's just a person that never bought with me that now is buying three or four uh, items and I'm scared, but I also want the $3,000 coming from this purchase. Right? So the, the outsourcing has this advantage that as a third party, I can look at all these orders. And if you were utilizing, even if you were utilizing their sales system, uh, I couldn't show you the other people's, the other merchants' transactions because of privacy uh, uh, reasons, right? So I can't show you this, but as a third party doing the manual revisions, I can, I can look at this, the whole context of a certain order. In the, I mean, ClearSale has been doing this for in the last almost 20 years. So if you make a, made a purchase at Timex, for instance, that is our customer, 
three years ago, and now you're trying to buy this furniture. Now I know that you're the same yourself. I mean, the same address or the same credit card or anything like that. So um, that's more or less how I would describe the, the, the ideal scenario here. Yeah, I like the point you said about looking over all the data, right? Because being able to see multiple merchants, you do start to see these patterns. Um, and even it's not just the right. card, it's also even the address. Um, Everything. So easy example I found is freight forwarders. They usually, so if you don't, if people don't know, um, you, there are these addresses out there where you send a package to that address, they receive the package and then forward it on to wherever else in the world. Um, over time started kind of building up a list of these addresses and realized, okay, even if the order checks every other box, just those should be like, those are just higher on the, on the score basically of saying if it's a freight forwarder and they're forwarding it somewhere internationally, let's, let's flag that one. Cause that should at least be reviewed if it's over whatever dollar value. And it kind of built up those, but having all those addresses, you kind of need, cause they're just like nondescript industrial addresses where you don't know necessarily until you really go through the work of realizing, oh, that's a freight forwarder. You put it on that list of, you know, higher, um, like you score them a little higher on that list of yeah, these, are, these are some addresses, just we want to, you know, flag them yellow sort of thing. Yeah, correct. So I think there are two points that come from your example, the freight uh, of the freight forwarders. The first point is, if you're doing by yourself, eventually you won't have the chance of understanding a priori before you make some research that this is a freight forwarder. While clear sale, obviously, with you know millions of transactions every month, we have a preset list of addresses that we know that are freight forwarders. That's the point number one. Yeah. yeah. The point number two is um, eventually, now that you know that as a freight forwarder. Uh, uh, what will you do? I mean, will you decline the order? And my answer is no. I mean, declining the order upfront will affect your business eventually more than the chargebacks would. Why? Because it's a, there's a correlation between, as you said, larger orders in, the, in terms of money and riskier orders. So if you, you, if you start looking at every order as risky and you start declining those, you're going to uh, damage your, your revenue. And especially if you're in a growth phase with your, your merchant, with your business, you don't want to do that because if you decline the, uh, a good customer today, uh, there are researches that tell, surveys that tell that you, the, the good customers will, with 60% of chance, not return to your website if they were declined at first. Right? And, so, and those are some for, of the best, those could be some of your best orders as well. And some of the probably, best, like yeah. some examples are, we would have like schools come in and buy, you know, normally if someone buy like one or two units, a school will come in and just buy 200 units. So in the score, that would look a lot higher. Like why is someone buying, like why is someone just buying hundreds of units? But it turns out those are actually the best customers and you actually wanted them. So I like the concept of holding it, but not like just rejecting and saying, Hey, you bought too many units. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know? And if you talk about, for instance, uh, super wealthy people, yep. I mean, I, I wrote an article the other day about it. Um, they will have multiple addresses, multiple phones. They will be hesitant in confirming data if you call them. Eventually, it's going to be hard to talk to them on the phone. Uh, you have secretaries and people in the middle. Um, and, and that's not a reason to decline them. You know? So you, you've got to have this mindset. And that's, how, that's why ClearSale is called ClearSale. We're talking about freedom to sell, not you know, risk mitigation or, or fraud reduction or anything like that. Because we're... My, my, my two cents, if, if somebody has to, uh, will uh, have one takeaway from our conversation today is looking at fraud prevention is obviously the number one objective is reducing fraud, but you can't be, you know, too much harsh on the order so that you affect the business at first in the first place. I mean, you only have the, to prevent fraud if you're selling. There's, a, there's an easy way of not having any fraud. You just don't sell anything, right? <laughs> So, uh, and, and it's an easy way of, I mean, so you, you said before, chargebacks are kind of necessary. If you're having zero chargebacks, that's probably because your filters, there's something wrong in your website. Your products are not attractive enough to fraudsters or your most likely, your, your fraud filters are too harsh. They're not allowing these orders, these transactions, not even to turn into transactions so that you can uh, accept or decline. So many people are, for instance, many uh, businesses, are uh, avoiding to sell cross-border because they are afraid of chargebacks. And, and what I tell to this merchant is, yes, if you have problems in logistics, if you're not uh, ready for market, marketing-wise, 
I respect. But if it's a matter of fraud, there are companies out there that can help you. And in case of clear sale, we can even back you up uh, financially. So approve those orders. And if it, they are chargebacks, clear sale will reimburse them to you. So in the end of the day, you, you have a financial backup to any of these movements you want. But despite of, uh, despite of utilizing our not clear sale, the focus of fraud prevention is the balance between reducing fraud, but without affecting the revenues. Awesome. I love it. It sounds like you guys are doing some pretty uh, interesting stuff over there. So people should definitely check you out. If people want to uh, learn more um, about ClearSale, about you, where should they do so? Well, I definitely encourage people looking at our website, clear.sale. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, we post, uh, we have blog posts uh, two or three times a week, uh, very focused on, on e-commerce aspects in general, not, not only fraud. So blog.clear.sale is a good resource, a good source of information for anything else. And if, if anybody wants to re reach out directly to me, feel free. My email is rafael.lorenco, my first and last name, at clear.sale. Awesome. It was great chatting with you. I will definitely uh, link all that in the show notes and people should check that out. So thanks a lot for coming on. Sure. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you.